appreciate you taking time to visit with me. Yeah, she's um, a friend of my nephew, so I guess. Yeah, she told me that. I, I was listening to the interview today, and I'm like, yeah, you did scoop me, little snake. <laughs> she's just getting into it, so. Um, I want to double check some of the facts I have. Who exactly do you work for? It's, it's, it's complicated. It's uh, everybody and nobody. Um, so the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously, but then I'm an independent contractor um, with several different entities, including the Chiefs Radio Network, ESPN, uh, Fox Sports, depending on the games, and then I have my own company. Okay, what is so, the name of your company? It's just Holtus Enterprises LLC. Oh, right. yeah. I speak across the country. I do. Uh, I have some personal services contracts. Um, do some additional promotional marketing uh, and management training uh, through my company. So there's three different. I always say it's an apple, orange, and a banana. Okay. So it's very complicated. Okay. You are still the lead broadcast voice for Fox Sports, for Fox Sports and ESPN for a lot of the college games, Big 12, Big 10, SEC. Well, ESPN, I do. The Big 12 is ESPN Missouri Valley. Fox is Missouri Valley. So it's primary ESPN now. Okay. So it's, it's gosh, literally 75% ESPN and 25% Fox. But primarily the Big 12, Missouri Valley Conference, and then some SEC, some American, occasional Big 10. Primarily Big 12, Missouri Valley. Do you still do the NIT games? Uh-huh. Okay. Sunday night. It's a mad spring. What was? Uh, where'd you go to high school? Smith Center. It was Smith Center High School. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I uh, was reading that you were a multi-sport athlete in high school, but you started announcing games in high school. Yeah, actually, um, I was in as a high school student. I went to a small school, Smith Center, small, like sixty in my graduating class, but it's high achieving athletically. There's a book written about it, Our Boys, which is a really good book to read. It's a New York Times bestseller. A New York Times writer embedded for a year in Smith Center. I'm from the central west end of Manhattan, not Kansas, but uh, New York, and lived there for a year and wrote a fabulous book. Hmm. Uh, but they're very high achieving athletically, particularly football. It's a town of 2,500 people, and they've had 15 Division One football players. Wow. So it's... it's Unique, neat, 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 neat place. It's also famous as uh, home of Home on the Range Cabin, where it was was written. The cabin's still there. It's preserved by my family. Now we're in a 501c3, so I do that too in my spare time. And then uh, your spare time. <laughs> yeah, I've been working on that some of the evenings in the last couple of days. We're doing a couple of fundraisers. And then uh, uh, it's also famous because it's near the center of the 48 states, right, uh, the Smith Center High School. So. Yeah, I did. I started in, uh, so I was a uh, gym rat. I wasn't very good at anything, but tried everything. And, uh, but I also was involved in competitive speaking, forensics. And I thought, how do you put those two together? So actually the local high school, our local radio station, which was in Phillipsburg, Kansas, to our tribal, but they had the station. Uh, I started doing work uh, with them on a volunteer basis. And that's kind of how I got my start. Where it's colors. What's that? What's the radio station's colors? Now it's KQMA. KQMA? Yeah, it was KKAN. And there was a guy named Tad Feltz, F-E-L-T-S, who uh, has since retired, but he actually broadcast my games. And then uh, and I competed against his son, and yet he was, he was kind of a first mentor, my first, he was a gateway uh, into the business, so to speak. Okay. Since you were a kid, did you always know that you wanted to work in sports or broadcast? Yeah, I was always kind of a sports nut. Um, I grew up on a farm, and my two brothers, two great brothers, but neither one of them were sports fan at all, so I was, I was always playing by myself, right? Mm -hmm. But I was always using my imagination. So every spot on the farm was a different stadium. That's fun. I could, I could tell you where Oakland and San Diego, and, and I would do these imaginary games and play them. And 
And so, yeah, I was always kind of a nut that way. Uh, <laughs> and then in high school, I was involved in forensics. So I did extemporaneous speaking and I did informative speaking. Um, we were too small to have debate, but I did a little bit of college debate. But then I thought, how do you split sports and speaking together? So, And in a small high school, you can do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things I loved about Haley being in her school was she could be involved. She was in select choir. She was involved in theater. She was also an athlete. And you go to IMAX, same thing. That's exactly what I did. I yeah. did theater, choir, and all the sports. Yeah. All through senior year. <laughs> There's a value in that. And so I grew up that same way. Mm -hmm. So, um, Since you did some radio work for your high school, how did you get into that? Well, I thought, how do I start in this? And there was a radio station 30 miles away in a town called Phillipsburg. And so I just approached him and said, can I do something to help you? And so uh, I actually started doing a school report for my school uh, and recorded it, sent it to him. And they then used that as a prototype to do other programs. But uh, that's how I got started. That's so really cool. Just volunteered and, and thought, I just need to get a, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to start doing it. It was great. A small station so you can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, when did you know you had made it in the broadcast business? You never make it in the broadcast business. And even being in the National Football League, this will be my 25th season, it's, it's very similar to playing or coaching. You may be a veteran, but the feeling is you never make it. The, the great players in, this, in the NFL are those who treat every year like it's their rookie season. And I found uh, I do the same thing. So every year is a new year. Every year is a year you can get cut. Uh, so I would say you never make it, and that's a good thing. I always, and I've got one of the one of the uh, mantras. Uh, and I really think it's a battle cry in broadcasting. Is uh, never give up, but never arrive. It's a continual journey. That's the most successful coaches, players, and broadcasters that I've been around have that attitude. Never give up, but never arrive. Yep. Well, in, in listening to the interview with Danielle, you're more than the voice of the Chiefs. You're an ambassador for them, and you talked a whole lot about leadership. I think your was it your daughter that was there with you whenever she interviewed? Yeah, she you? was. Y'all mm -hmm. talked a lot about leadership. That's something I'm really interested in. Yeah. Talk talk a little bit about um, leadership and what it means in your well, industry as a sportscaster, or just in general. Yeah, I think well, in particular, if you narrow it down to if you're the voice of, I don't care if you're the UCM Mules or the Jennies or Marshall, Missouri, you you are a bit of a steward of what's revered in that community um, and you're a, you're a steward of the message so to speak being the voice of the chiefs the biggest area of surprise for me because the impact of the chief's kingdom and, and I'll humbly say that I came up with the concept of the chief's kingdom mm -hmm. it was and it was after being involved for years but seeing that it crossed state lines it crossed genders, it, it crossed uh, urban to rural, and I thought there needs to be something unique that defines it. And so I thought, the kingdom, well it's stuck and now it's, it's grown very organically. But what I found is surprising is the role of responsibility that you have as kind of being the gatekeeper of the message, so to speak, for lack of a better term, but how... <laughs> whether it's the Joplin Tornado or working with charities or touching the human fabric of your constituency or your listeners. Just this past December, I'm going to start doing some work with Alpha Point, which is for the blind, basically, visually impaired. But there was a story of a young man named Cameron Black who is blind, been blind since birth, but he just loves listening to the Chiefs games 
and he, he didn't know much about football. He and his dad have worked together on, on uh, trying to discuss the game, but he said, you know, I, I, I just learned so much by listening to him. And that, that really took me aside because it was another example of the impact and the responsibility that you have as a broadcaster, particularly if you're the voice of a team or a director of a department that goes beyond what we think is, it goes beyond the obvious. And uh, there's so many examples of people, men and women, who have been voices in their communities, but it, it becomes a way of life where it goes beyond, way beyond the game. It goes beyond being uh, available and being a steward. Of, because one of the things I think I do, um, and some of the things I do are criticized, but I really, emphasize the human elements of the game because humans play the game it's not it's not a digital game and humans watch it humans listen to it humans play it um, humans coach it and, and then all the emotion that's involved so one thing I emphasize are all the things that triggers a lot of things that trigger those human emotions uh, one thing is in the Chiefs game I spend a ponderous amount of time in preparation and in many instances I'll always try to find the local angle even if it's the other team like um, if, if they're from the Chiefs Kingdom or have some connection to the Chiefs Kingdom in any way whether they played college ball at UCM or whether they were the you know Max Lane from Northern Missouri that's going to be a, a real focus of the broadcast weaving into the, the story of the game because I know how much it means to those communities. And we have, we're the largest network now in the National Football League and those affiliates. I mean, there was a play where Sam Cook of the Ravens had a punt blocked. We blocked his punt. He was from Seward, Nebraska, played at Nebraska. And John McGraw blocked the punt and he's from Keats, Kansas, played at K-State. And so it was a Chiefs Kingdom block and a Chiefs Kingdom. And so... But those are things that make that game come alive, and it triggers the human element. Um, so it's just when you do that and you activate those human sensors, if you were, or the emotional sensors, then that opens up the door to things that go beyond life mm -hmm. and where people have a connection to you or the team, and that means they're connected beyond football. So... That's been the, really the most surprising thing, really in the last 15 years of just the personal and emotional things you get involved with just because you're the voice of the team. And I really have learned that that since, since then that you're a, you're a steward or a gatekeeper of that in many ways. Do you mind if I use the young man's name? Was it Cameron? Black? Cameron Black. Yeah, it's, Black. it's a public story. You can, okay. you can Google it on the Kansas City Star, December, late December. And... You'll see the, uh, uh, there's a video that the star produced. Uh, he actually showed up at the Chiefs Kingdom show. Man, it might have been the same one she was at. Close to us, about that it, same It show. sounds familiar. I think you mentioned yeah. him to her. Yeah. So. so uh, um, what was your favorite memory or game or interview you've ever done? Just a fun question. the cheese it would be winning the playoff game in Houston and I told the uh, engineer because it had been at that time so it was 15 it was my 22nd year we hadn't won a playoff game in 22 years so my first year was the start of the no playoff wins they'd won they got the AFC championship the year before I told the if it's a blowout I told the engineer or the, the uh, producer tell me when it's 35 seconds because I wanted to know when it was 22 seconds on the clock. It, you go back and find it. You can find it on YouTube. But I, I said, let me know, because when it was 22 seconds, I counted down basically 22 years. And it was a watershed moment, because it was an achievement that we hadn't had. And I wanted to honor Coach Reed, because he brought us that, because we were algae on the Titanic when he got here. We were too, people forget that. So we're so quick to forget. It's, I just heard a, message, spiritual message, like we remember what 
we forget what we should remember, and we remember what we should forget. If people are quick now, they're like, Coach Reed's an idiot, and we're awful, and he brought us out of wilderness. Yeah. Okay, but that moment was a special moment, Chiefs wise, <laughs> as I look back on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Career-wise, uh, I don't know, my, my mind's kind of changed on that. Uh, sometimes it's a great game, and sometimes it's getting a call in the middle of the night from people in Joplin who just had their town wiped out, going, we've got to have the Chiefs help. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Well, we'll try to get going. And then in three days, we filled seven semi-loads of water, and then we took a group down there. And so those are moments that are As positive to me as, as doing a winning game. I want to win a Super Bowl, uh, and I, you know, still. But I need to be the voice of hope. That's the other kind of highlight. Is if I'm a voice of hope, and again, remember how unifying this is, um, and people kind of surround it. Not saying it should be more important than it is, but it's just what it is. But within that, now they're in despair. Like we stink and. We, Season's going to crap, and Peters is throwing flags, and so but, but I need to be. So I was on with Kevin Keesman last week, and I, there was a quote from Eugene Peterson, a writer, that talks about either we languish in hope, I mean, we languish in despair, or we are a person of hope, and it's far easier to be in despair because there's no risk in it, really. If you're in hope, I'm an idiot. I stand. I'm the village idiot, going, you know, let's go. We, there's hope. Let's do this. No, I might exactly be different. Okay, so there you go. But, yeah. but that's if you're that way as a person. So anyway, those are highlights maybe that aren't, hey, we won the game and I got to make the call. Those are highlights that I'm learning different things. And I've learned from these guys. And these guys spent two and a half years in Botswana in the Kalahari Desert. We went to visit them. It was seven and a half hours from the capital city. It was like, like where are we going? And it was like this. And it, but they were awesome people. It kind of opened up my view of the world. Right there, you know? So they, it's different people having influences. The baseball camp this summer actually really inspired me to go on mission trips, so I'm kind of going one on spring break. Good for you. Last question. So how did you come up with the touchdown Kansas City or the, this is what my dad wanted me to ask you, the Big, 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 big wildcat. If you can win. find, uh, it's also documented because it was in the media guides my last year. There's a whole page of how many bigs were for each win. Yeah, he said and the, I the bigger them. the win, the more bigs there were. Yeah. And it became, so people would listen, how many bigs is this? Like if Wisconsin beats Penn State, how big is that win? And they would listen at the end and count them. And they knew that, oh, okay. And so it's, and there, that was listed on a whole page in the, uh, the media guide when I was toward my end. It, so it was kind of this, it was archived. Um, they happen organically. You can't force yeah. them. You can't force them. And one of the perils that I had in my job is I replaced a very popular guy, Kevin Harlan. Oh, baby, what a play. This throaty voice, you know, uh, still does. TNT and stuff and so he still lives here so people are like you know and for years I had to hear you're no Kevin Harlan like you're okay but you're no Kevin Harlan that was okay I was like that didn't matter right uh, but the signature call came because I thought what could I do that would in a sublime way make people think of all this every time we score a touchdown it's why well, I'll say the sweet nectar of the end zone NFL touchdowns are hard to get so what what analogous thing can I do? What's well, sweet nectar? I mean, the players laugh about it, so, but every touchdown becomes a celebration of this whole city when it's Kansas City. And so you're a musician, it's the staccato note. And so what, when you sing sometimes, uh, there are times you emphasize based on the notes, right? Well, it's, it's made to be a staccato because of the hard consonant, can, says city, hard concept, hard concept, so it's, but every touchdown becomes a celebration. So what's cool, our little kids tonight are coming up and doing it. So a little kid's doing it when he's out playing, in, or he or she's out playing in the yard or messing around. But in a sublime way, it's a celebration every time it happens. So. 
I noticed um, before the show would come back and they were doing the highlights and you, your call, and every time they did Touchdown Kansas City, your head would go, Touchdown Kansas <laughs> You nodded on the team with it. I thought that was pretty funny. Well, it's just in my just, brain, yeah. I think. But there's, it's, it happened organically, so I don't think there was some epiphany of when it did, but there's a reason for it. all I had. Okay. Well, cool. You've got a good friend in Adam. How has the job changed since you started? Um, the digital world has changed it dramatically. And like any move forward or any exploration of a, a new space, if you will, that can be positive, that can be negative. Um, One is there's some new sources of information because of the digital world, but it has made the listener or viewer, as it were, your constituency more informed because they have that same information at their disposal in many cases. So the challenge is to, and I was also a law clerk for two years and was going to be an attorney. Glad I didn't do that. But <laughs> what I did learn was to to go beyond the obvious. So there, try to dig and find stories. Go to sources where you I tell you something you didn't already know, and then you either you can give me attribution or you don't. It doesn't matter. But you're coming back to me even in a sublime way as a source of information. But you now have way more information than people had five to seven years ago. The other way it's changed is that now everyone has become a critic. Um, and generally, and somehow the digital worlds can bring up the worst in mankind mm -hmm. because they can do it anonymously. You can hide behind a rock and throw snowballs. And as a result, you uh, it opens up the door for just it's it's not constructive criticism it's just criticism or uh, because if the more prominent you become in the media world the, whether I don't care what endeavor you're in there's just going to be more in people and you're not, not everybody's going to like you uh, but everybody seemingly is a critic um, even when I speak publicly now you don't wait for the evaluation at the handout at the end. They're giving it to you during the talk. Because I'll check Twitter after I speak and there are, and people are, you know, they're tweeting about it. Um, so I would say the digital world has changed it dramatically. And, and so you try to accentuate the positive of the digital world, but you somehow try to mitigate the negative. And I think that's a big challenge as we become a little more insecure as a society and, and very insecure um, or lack of a filter in the way that we handle um, opinions in di digital media. Okay. Your name has come up a lot in my next question. Who are your favorite sportscasters? Mm. Almost everyone I've interviewed has said, well, Mitch Holtis is just fantastic. <laughs> well, it's too nice. Um, There are guys that I admire a lot. Brad Sham of the Dallas Cowboys. Right. He's Brad Sham, S-H-A-M, play-by-play. Growing up, there were three that had a specific influence on me. Um, Jack Buck, because I grew up in rural on the Kansas-Nebraska border. So... There wasn't an app on my phone to listen to the game. so I, And I was a Cardinal fan until the Royals came into existence. So Jack Buck was 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 a uh, was some iconic to me. But then uh, Fred White, who did the Royals for many years, passed too soon, and did K-State and the Royals, was a very, very strong mentor of mine. It hurt when he passed because he would be one that I could... Uh, go to for critique 
or he would watch just I didn't know he was watching and then he'd say he would either you know he would, he would he'd be in an encouraging style but he'd also give some helpful hints and there was a guy named Dev Nelson who also did Kansas State as I was growing up he was a broadcaster voice the Wildcats if you will who was extremely articulate and his delivery was impeccable he was kind of the old school uh, announcer but uh, say Dev Dev Nelson D E V N E L S O N uh, but those in particular had a specific influence on me. Well, speaking about well, speaking about mentors, that's that's something that's come up a lot. Is in your profession, there there seems to be this this innate need within the sportscasters to mentor the young men and women coming up. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, many opportunities to do that sort of thing? Yeah, and, and <laughs> countless really. I lose track of them, and, and a lot of people seek out. I don't have time. Um, I have to be, and that's, you know, it's difficult. I'm not in a role where I'm in education, so I don't have 50 students enrolling in class. But there are some that I'll, I'll, I have chosen to take beyond and mentor, you know, Mr. Miyagi style, I guess. Uh, But I always tell them, I try to challenge them as much as I can. And I try to be very realistic with them because uh, they have to see a lot of pers- prospective ad- or, um, broadcasters, women and men, do it because one, it sounds fun, two, it's their leisure, I mean, they, so it's something they enjoy, it's not, a, they're not, but when your profession becomes someone else's leisure, that changes the dynamic completely. And that's where the disconnect happens. Uh, you're not playing fantasy football anymore. You're, it's, there's a responsibility there, and there's a tremendous amount of sacrifice. I always tell them, if, if there's five holidays a year, which four are you willing to give up? You get one, but you're going to lose four. And um, time away from family. And your time is not your own. But my biggest challenge, you could put this in there, is... Uh, and I'm a little busier than most and because people in many cases only see the tip of the peak they don't see all the other stuff that I do and but also my time is not my own when Andy Reid says he wants to see you at 3 o'clock you don't go well let's make it can we make it tomorrow at 5 um that doesn't work and, and the game is scheduled at X you don't go well let's move that game next week um, or in an attorney's case they're going to you know, file an extension that, that doesn't happen so as a result uh, there have been a tremendous amount of sacrifices of personal time and that's what I try to tell young prospective students is you, if you can't check that box it's, it's not going to work, and that's why there's not very many that do it, really. I mean, mm-hmm. you, and you've seen them fall by the wayside. Um, the pay's not very good at the beginning of a career. You have to be multitasking if you want to uh, you know, do well at it. A business background, I think, is very important. I, always, I would tell all your students that if they have elective hours, is to get those in business. I mean, I got a journalism degree at K-State, but I had enough elective hours that I have a I have a degree in business as well. So that becomes helpful because you can multitask, whether that's involved in marketing or sales. or. Uh, but, again, it's, uh, you, you, it's certainly not eight to five. It's, it's just it's a gob of work. And then you, the people who join the journey with you, whether that's a spouse or your, your family or whomever, has to understand that's part of the deal. Um, I mean, I have regrets of things that I've missed, but I've got a terrific family, and they've also had the blessing to be involved in some pretty cool activities, but it's very atypical. And you're not going to hit every union and every family event and, and uh, make it to holidays. For example, since we started training camp, I think July the 24th, this is March the 8th, just days off, starting from sun up to when your head hits the pillow, having days off. I would 
let's say less than 10. They're just, they're seven days a week. And uh, so uh, if you're going to, if you're going to do it and do it at a high level and sign on, then you've got to be willing, if you're at Marshall, Missouri, you're going to, you're going to do the boys tournament this week or the girls tournament next week, and then you may be doing baseball and Monette at some regional, and you're gonna your, your time really is is not your own. So uh, you have to have to manage that. Well, that feeds well into my next question. I watched a video of you today. They, yeah. they brought cameras up into the booth while you yeah. were calling a Chiefs game. Yeah. As Oakland and Kansas City last year. Sixteen. And Thursday night, it decided the division. Actually, yeah, it was a Thursday night. Yeah. Game. And the energy that you showed calling the game. After all these years, after your schedule, less than 10 days off in a year, how do you maintain that level of energy? Well, you try to maximize the time that you do have as far as, like, one thing. We really, my wife and I try to emphasize exercise, hydration. I'm not great with diet, try to do it, but... Uh, you, when there's time to rest, you rest. Whether that's getting six hours of sleep or seven hours of sleep. Um, and again, the, the days are so strange. There's times I'll come home at two or three, leave it for two or three, but you have to be disciplined to rest when you rest. Um, the hydration and exercise, uh, I've my uh, daughter-in-law, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister is a speech therapist, and she's been very helpful as far as learning breathing techniques and delivery. And, but, um, uh, and then I would say, too, to be, to be prepared. Uh, like, those games, uh, and I was embarrassed by that video, but that's just the way it is. I mean, once you see it, you're like, wow, okay, I guess I'm not crazy. But everybody that's in that booth every week will say that's what he is. And so it's not a phony. Mm -hmm. It wasn't phony. And when people listen to it, they realize, oh, my gosh, I mean, he's, he's going to be exhausted after those games, which I am. So one of the times off during the week are Sunday nights at home games, and that's a date night with my wife. But you just kind of decompress and, and uh, have a nice dinner with the wife, but you're, you're tired, right? Um, so, uh, and it's just kind of the way I'm wired to, uh, and, but being prepared, understanding the moment, understanding what it means to those 70,000 people watching and the 1.2 million people listening. I mean, it's the NFL. It's not, I'm not giving a narration of uh, a concert at the Kauffman Center. So they're kind of hyped up. People that go to the game are like, wow, this is exciting. This is So you need to capture the moment. So that's just kind of the way I am. It's, it's, it's a natural reaction of mine, I guess, and, uh, but it's not contrived. Yeah. It didn't look contrived. Yeah, it, did. <laughs> it looked pretty yeah, Not playing pretty the camera. Camera. Um, um, I was also watching an interview you did with uh, Aaron Lawless some years back for Straight out of KC. Yeah, it was online. Mm -hmm. And you had talked about uh, you have a passion for sports, but not just because of sports, but also because of what sports means to fans. What do you mean by that? Well, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. It, <laughs> it's kind of the activation of the five senses. Um, it's really a part of the fabric of our existence, and that is... Excitement, sadness, triumph, tragedy, uh, and emotion. Something that is shared with others, either good or bad. You may dislike the person next to you or like him because they're rooting for the wrong team. But there's very few things that we do in our lives that activate those kind of inner fibers of our existence like sports does. And even those that aren't into sports, maybe that's going to Handel's Messiah and it's, you know, the Hallelujah Chorus. But 
Like in the NFL, it's like watching the Messiah every week. And the anticipation of that event, then it actually happens. But then, and that's why I've seen it's been a conduit to people's lives. And, and you could argue saying, well, it has too much importance. It's got more importance than it should have. And that can be argued, but it's, I think they're missing the point. The point is it's activating their fabric and the way God made them. Because the things that we were created as beings, whether it's like, dislike, love, I mean, in sports, that is all kind of brought to the surface. So that's why it's been an interesting study to see. People go, well, hey, why are you so down? It's just a game. Well, yeah, to some, some extent, it's just a game. But losing that game to Tennessee, was that just a game to Alex Smith? Or was that he brought winning to Kansas City? That losing that game meant now what? And what's that mean for Elizabeth and his three kids and the Alex Smith Foundation and the work he's done in this community? And a fan sometimes can turn a game on or off and walk away. But if people or those fans are really engaged in that game, uh, then it's, it is more than a game because it's activating the human emotion or the way God created us to be. It's one of my frustrations with doing sometimes basketball when I'm, for example, I'm going to go do the Sun Belt Tournament and I'm not going to feel the emotion I will portray it Convey it, because, convey it because those games are the most important thing to those schools and those kids. They're playing from automatic birth on national television. Um, but my emotional involvement isn't as tense as a Chiefs game, where walking out of the Tennessee game, first of all, it took hours to even walk out of the stadium because I knew I knew what that meant. I knew it could probably, probably was the last game with Alex Smith, Derek Johnson I've been with for 13 years, Tamba Holly for 12, um, and you, it's more than a game. Why do you feel it that deeply? Well, because of the human elements that are involved. And so, if I'm sitting and playing a game of cards or playing a game of Madden with somebody and I lose, it's not the same as losing that game. Um, so, uh, I've learned down through the years just the game beyond the game, for lack of a better term. man of your faith, and your brother was telling me that. Um, I went to a Catholic high school, and I've been to, I've been at the same school ever since I was preschool. I was raised Catholic, and I actually went to the Mike Sweeney Catholic baseball camp this summer and helped coach out, coach there. Good. And I had a Good really, you. it was really fun. Um, I had a really overpowering moment of faith while I was there. I just couldn't really believe the opportunity I was having. Do you ever have those overpowering moments during your career, just in life with your faith? Uh, yes, and, and some can be triggered by an incredibly positive mountaintop experience. Others can be triggered by what we call flashpoints. And there's, it's, uh, what I've learned, and I learned in, in my, so I was going to go to law school. I was accepted to three law schools. I was going to go to, I mean, I was accepted to Kansas, Washburn, and Valparaiso Law. I law clerk for two years. So I was on this path by broadcasting and business, but then ah, I'm going to go to law school. And, uh, but it was really kind of a flashpoint uh, of like really getting into the depth of my heart. Is that what's right? Is that what I really want to do? Is that, um, but it was also a faith moment because faith is personal, it's personal. Like, we can do corporate things with faith, like I can walk into a church and sing songs and be in here, but it's, it's, it's a, that's a byproduct of something personal in your heart, I think. And so my relationship with the Lord is, is the pebble in the pond for everything, whether it's good or bad or, and, uh, but that's been up and down too, like, and, you know, and, um, but that's kind of the voyage, right? And uh, so there's blessings and there's challenges and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, 
uh, but that and that also helps me in dealing with athletes and coaches and fans and and yet I'll get down I mean these guys help encourage me Haley's a terrific encouragement for me because I'll get down and I'm not exactly like super high right now but yeah. but you, you have there's a baseline that you can go to and then uh, you know, one of my favorite verses is like, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testament of our Lord or of me as prisoner. Paul was writing this. Uh, but join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Um, and that verse goes on and on, but it's, it's something that I've, I was laying awake in the middle of the night, like just thinking about it about it because there was a zillion things on my mind and not all of them were good and well in fact most of them weren't but uh, it's it's dealing with every situation and uh, trying to positively impact lives I have a whole speech that I give called making it count it's going beyond the mic M-I-C so many things at this job I've talked to these guys about it they know most don't where it's it's more the role of the job than the job itself. That doesn't make sense, but I'll just give you an example. So an Air Force family had a little girl that had an operable leukemia. Whiteman Air Force Base, right by you. And they contacted the team and said, we, want, we just want to meet with him because he seems like a happy guy. Like, we just need to meet with a happy guy. We've tried all this treatment and bone marrow transplants. And she just needs to be around a happy guy. I'm like, I'm not a psychiatrist or a doctor, or, and okay, I guess I'll meet with them. And it was, but it was awesome. And she, this little gal, just, you know, just inspired me and more than I, I didn't even know what to do. And then she died like two months later. But, but it was that, I'm thinking, wait a minute here, there's a bigger role than football or games because of the, uh, the impact of what it is. Not to give it more impact than it, than it should have, but it's one of the few things. You think how divided we are as a country now. It's one of the few times where all these people here, we had black people, we had white people, we had Hispanic people, we had little kids, we had older people, we had people from Blue Springs, we had people that came from a long way away. I'm sure we had Republicans and Democrats and, and far left, far right, whatever. But they came here tonight and it was a common cause. There, there are very few things that present that common cause. This is one of them. But because of that, there's a power in it to help. That was just like Kelsey tonight. So Kelsey's got a conduit of power through his his 87 and running deal to help Operation Breakthrough or Shadow Buddies. Or, and, and that's why I talk to these guys all the time. They, that's what I've learned. It's, it's as much about that as, as uh, saying 21 to 7. However, you're in an environment of winning or losing or sad or tough or, you know, people lose their jobs. We're gonna have people lose their jobs. So when it's when it's someone's leisure, we don't think about it like that. Yeah. If it was the city of Raytown and they're gonna lay off 30 people tomorrow, we're like, oh my gosh, that's brutal. Well, that's gonna happen to us in about a month because of what's gone on. And so the empathy I need to take to the workplace and my attitude and helping is beyond saying second and seven, if that makes sense. So the more you learn that in your career and you become that way, it, it, you have a chance to be more valuable. And, and then the faith aspect comes alive because then it's a life that the Lord wants you to have, which is use this life to have impact, right? And influence, so. That's awesome. No, it's so a typical week. I'm involved in so many things as far as I try to get from Monday morning to get to Monday afternoon. Monday morning, I do radio uh, hits in the morning. Part of my uh, what I do on my own as an entrepreneur is I do the Minute with Mitch television series, which is in 10 TV markets. Well, I sell it, market it. Chiefs let me do it. It can't. hy is a sponsor in six of the 10. The other four, I've got to get sponsors that don't conflict with the Chiefs sponsors. But it's basically, I was ahead of my time. I started it 23 years ago. It's a video blog. And it fits 
on it can fit on any platform. It can I put I'll put it on Twitter, but it fits in over the air television platform too. It's perfect because it gives them perspective. It's cheese. People can't get enough. It, not always cheese, but sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's sad. It's designed to be that way. But I write a I write a video blog and produce it, sell it, market it. Um, and paying contractors to, to do it. but that's Monday mornings and Monday mornings now I'm exhausted go back to the video you saw you're like man the best thing to do would be to take Monday off and just chill but I don't I start with radio hits at 7 something in the morning with 101 there's two or the three others that morning then I do the minute with Mitch then I go to connect at Arrowhead because now the new week has started that's Sunday night, date night, for a, sun, a Sunday afternoon game is the only respite there is because it starts to roll again early the next morning. And then in the afternoon, I'll review the game before on video. And, uh, and because I'm, I interview Coach Reed, and then we have the Chiefs Kingdom show. So by the time Monday night rolls around, it's about 8 o'clock. By the time I start to roll home, and I'm more exhausted because of what it, you think about Sunday, and then Monday's a long day. It doesn't end until starts early in the morning, goes well into the evening, like a farmer. Tuesday um, is spent, I do over the air television shows. We do the High Beach Youth Insider Show. And we have great writers and producers, but sometimes I'll write or produce or edit or help with that. And that's, that's, that's a Tuesday approach because we have to have a deadline to get that done. And then Tuesday nights, and then I'm, I'm, and Tuesday morning there is a glimmer of time, a bit of time that I try to protect for exercise. I've got a personal trainer. I've got to do that or I just can't exist. And so I try to protect that time. Uh, Tuesday evening, I start preparation for the opponent for the upcoming week. Now, I've been working on them all year long, but... Now I start to micro in on it, and I start to micro in on the offense of the opponent. Go through every player, every possible story, uh, all the stats, um, and uh, but it also helps because the next morning, Wednesday, on Wednesday I do eight different radio shows, and. So the prep work that I'm doing on Tuesday night, Wednesday nights usually uh, finish the defense for the opponent. That's on Wednesday night. And I'll watch video, just like a coach. What's the, what's the individual stories? If you're playing for the Steelers, then what's your, oh, he was, he was a professor at University of Central Missouri. And then you're like, oh, that's that guy. So what? go beyond the obvious um, to prepare. Then, then it goes into Thursday. Now we do another over the air television show. I do production at 101 The Fox because we have game production for every week. Then I'll have interviews that I do with Andy Reid, the coordinators, players. Wednesday's also getting player sound. I'll chase down five or six players. I chart the players so that we're not just getting the same person every time. But a lot of, like on pregame, a lot of the uh, well, here's what Chris Conley had to say. I'm getting the Chris Conley sound. Not many play-by-play -play guys do that, but I'll, I mean, it's just we're on a skeleton crew. Have been since our uh, on the radio side. Uh, and then Tuesday night, it, so then the rest of Tuesday and Tuesday night is updating our guys versus that opponent. What have they done in their career against that opponent? And what are the stories that are there between these two teams or players on our team to the others. Reggie Raglan, if we're playing uh, uh, Buffalo Bills, go into the Raglan trade, what was into that? Or we play the Titans, uh, how he grew up as a Titan fan and not, you know, even though he's in Alabama, he wasn't very far away from Nashville and loved the Titans. Just an example. And then Friday, there's another snip at a time for the second exercise period, which is, that's all I get, or two, two periods, but I use them. Um, and then everything starts to come together then on Fridays more shows, I do 25 radio shows a week uh, two over the air televisions a television after the game which is the uh, Rewind, Chiefs Rewind and then the Minute with Mitch that's the beginning of the week uh, so Friday 
is bringing it all together now. And we have a production meeting, and where's our focus going to be? And usually I'm done by Friday at 4 o'clock. And so Friday nights are a time where I can have personal time. I love to go to high school football games if I can. Um, or I'll watch Smith Center at a terrific three-camera broadcast with lower third graphics, and it's amazing. And um, But that's a time where I can kind of relax my mind. But then Saturday I do shows again. If we're on the road, that's travel. Uh, if we're home, it has turned into almost half of them have become... There's events going on that Saturday that I'm the MC for, or I'm the moderator of a panel, or, uh, and so then it's the game day, and then you just keep, then it just cycles. And so uh, there's 60 to 70 hour weeks. Friday nights are protected. Those two little in, uh, uh, exercise times, and then home games Sunday nights. That's what you live for. I guess the question would be, Adam Winkler's going to be in the book. He's uh, down at KNEO, down in uh, Yoko, does yeah. the City Games. He yeah. told the story about you. He was at a, I think it was when he was in Ottawa. You were there to watch a game. Yeah. And you came down and got on the radio with him. He just, yeah. so I just took the chance. He said, you know, I got a great guy. He's from the he interview with me. He said, sure, and came on down and did it. Yeah. Why? Why do you that, do all of this? Um, <laughs> not, not, not that. I just, that was... I mean, it goes back to the passion it. part of it. It's 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 a, a deep passion and, and passion for competition, but passion for sport at all levels. Uh, my kids played at Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas, so they were NAI athletes, and they were playing. Uh, Southwestern was playing Ottawa in that game, and I had a chance to go see it. Uh, and then the Ottawa had a kid, a running back for them, that played in the NFL. So it's kind of a unique experience. I don't sit there and go to KCAC or MIAA games every Saturday. I don't have the time. But that was one chance. I thought, you know, we can do this. There's a time that we can do it. But it goes back to kind of the passion. Speaking of, I meant to ask you a question on that. Brian and Haley, how old are they? And do you have grandkids? Brian, yeah, I've got grandkids. Two granddaughters. Brian, uh, how old is it? 30? She's 35, Haley's 32. Brian has two daughters, so we've got two granddaughters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You've They've made tremendous sacrifices. Um, so has my wife. My wife gets it. She coached for 20 years, K State's point guard. Um, but that doesn't make it any easier. Um, I call them steering wheel pounders. Other the times that you miss, you can't get back, and that's that's one of the costs that I tell prospective at our perspective uh, broadcasters, just what are you willing to sacrifice and give up? Oh, I like to hunt. Well, you're not going to get a whole lot of time to hunt. I like to fish. Well, there'll be some times where you're trying to get as much time as you think or you used to have. Um, and in the case, uh, I miss my daughter won a state championship in basketball and my wife was helping coach the team and I didn't get to see it. I saw the quarters and semis, but I had to do a college basketball game and I drove through the night I stayed as long as I could was trying to do all my preparation in advance as much as I could but you know, I missed that game and I I you know I just I regret it but it, that's one of the prices that come with doing this so you talked a lot about the prices and everything what's the best part of being a sports guy? Uh, one that you're a part of it My dad wasn't a broadcaster. My granddad wasn't, or grandma wasn't a broadcaster. It's, this business, there's, there's a lot of nepotism in the business. Uh, born on third base and thought they had a triple kind of stuff is the way I like to describe it. And that's not the way it has, it's been with me. So uh, to be a part of it is a big deal. I love it, the fact that my kids don't want to do it. I would love it if they did, but I'm loving it that they don't because they've made their own way. And, and, but uh, the other, uh, so I love competition. I love it's the passion. And other than playing, coaching, or officiating, if you're going to do play-by-play of event, it's the closest thing there is to that. Excuse me. Because you can prepare.
and I do a prodigious amount of preparation, but you have no idea what's going to happen. It's not reading a teleprompter. And you have to be able to react. And there's there's a part of me that it's that my pilot light that that turns me on. That um, I don't know what's going to happen, and I've got to be react. Can I say the right words in a split second? Can uh, uh, because there is no rehearsal. There's preparation, but there is no rehearsal. It's like playing the game. And so I love that part of it. And then what I've learned to love is how it is a conduit to making your life really count for others. And that may sound like a trite or a uh, self-serving answer, but it's really not. It's what, is, it's what I continue to learn. It's, it's Cameron Black who's never seen a game, never seen anything in his life that gets the, the, the theater of the mind created for him. I said the theater of the mind is a great place to visit. It's one of my quotes. Uh, the theater of the mind is a great place to visit. But all that Cameron has is the theater of the mind. That's all he has. So if what I do is perform a in perform and draw a tapestry that creates the theater of his mind that's pretty awesome there's so many things you can do in life that gets to do that and so that's what I found out as the years have gone on there's, there's more and more examples of something like that uh, but it gives you a chance to make your life count with the, the life that the Lord's given you um, to make it count in ways that you didn't think you could, but you try to maximize it in the benefits you can have for others. So, yeah. Yeah, I could sell. Okay. I could, I could pay my own freight, basically. I still do. I have my own company, so I'm still involved in sales and marketing. People don't know that. I did not know that. Yeah. I saw that you... So get your sales background as well if you're interested oh, in the okay. business. I have a business degree and a journalism degree. It's I, very helpful. I researched that. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, my other question was, like as a college student, what kind of classes or organizations or clubs would you do to get involved in Yeah, and that? I want to get Mike and Haley involved in this too to see if they would... What did you? What classes did you find as far as community... They were, they were involved at Southwestern College in Winfield. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had an incredible leadership program. It's very practical, but it was like, but what classes do you think when you looked as an undergrad helped you guys? And you go, I love taking that. I'm taking like sports broadcasting right now. Yeah, but here's what I'm gonna tell you to do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, change, your, I'm gonna change your life here a little bit. It's why I got two degrees. I almost had a third degree in political science, but it's another story. But uh, I have two degrees. I have a business and journalism. Uh, try to get a broad-based background. Learn to write the king's English. Even though we're involved in social media and we're 120 characters and we do things, we abbreviate and we use acronyms. And I do it every day too. But the ability to communicate written and verbal is a commodity that you can't put a price on. And you think, well, that's normal in this business, but in anything, Mike works for the city of Raytown, and his ability to communicate, whether it's verbally or non-verbally, is vital to success. And, uh, and it's very important to have interpersonal skills, particularly where you're at, where you know people say, hey, we're millennials, or whatever's next for a millennial, I don't know what that is, but they're coming, and maybe you're in that. But, there's a struggle with having interpersonal skills, having this this conversation, and yeah. it's it's you need that at, on learn it in a lab on campus. So extra English, like you don't want to take, like you have to take comp one or comp two or whatever. To find out. I, I took a comp three course. Kind of miserable taking it, but I'm glad I did because it stretched me. Of like take it further. What's the next step? It was, you know, it's, it was a harder class, but it challenged me, yeah. and it really helped me. And then, uh, to be creative. What is there to expand your horizons to be creative? 
So you can take any undergraduate major to do this career. I always, and this undergraduate career, undergraduate major in most campuses allows you a lot of electives. Be wise with those electives. Um, whether it's business or even leadership, um, something that's going to set you apart. For example, one thing that's very underrated about what I do, and people don't even think about it, is what I'm going through right now. It's, it's not a great workplace environment. And it hasn't been for a while. But women and men who want to get into this field don't understand the psychology of sport. And the psychology of sport is, what do you ask Travis Kelsey when you've lost six out of seven games? How do you deal with Coach Reed? How do you deal with players? How do you deal with when you go into, it would be like uh, you knowing that you didn't have the money to go to school next semester. What am I going to do? So how do I relate to you? What's my interpersonal skills? Empathy. These two guys, and my daughter taught me and teaches me even today about empathy. Like they, they were in Africa for two and a half years, but empathy, having a heart for people, like not surface, but like deep. And uh, one thing I'm kind of proud of is when we go through times like this, people will come to me. Like, I just need to, I'm going to talk to you. They're like, well, I'm not a counselor, but they're, they're either, are they drawn to you or repelled by you? And so I'm thinking, well, this is part of my mission, is not just to say touchdown Kansas City, but to have to learn empathy, understand how to communicate, how to listen, but to have a heart. That comes from taking psychology classes. That comes from being involved in like a leadership program where you lead and you also follow, like these guys did. They were put in roles where they follow, right? Yeah. There's a, the last part of the book is about tips and strategies for young broadcasters from the professionals. So the first part is you, your backstory yeah. and then this part. So um, you talked about the amount of prep that goes into preparing for a game. Can you kind of walk me through a week? It's hard to do, but I'm going to give you the four P's. Now, and this is in preparation is one of them. But passion, preparation. Uh, perseverance and perspective. And if you can't check all four boxes, this is not for you. And it's not for everybody. Um, so I'll get to preparation in a second. But the passion is, I've kind of told you, you, got, you have to understand as a broadcaster the passion of the event. In fact, if there is a, it's something I encourage you to do as you develop your curriculum work, is to, and this bleeds over time into, into, psych, into pers or, uh, perspective, but so many perspective broadcasters have no idea about the psychology of sport. And there has to be an understanding. In fact, I would add a course in your curriculum where it's basically the psychology of sport. We under, okay, understanding winning and understanding losing, and then put them in a practical laboratory where they, they experience both. It's why if they can compete, and I don't care if it's curling, I always recommend and encourage them to compete in something so that you understand it. There has to be an understanding if you're in this, the deep hurt that comes with losing and what that means and the ecstasy of winning and what that means. Uh, so that's really the perspective, but it also deals with the passion um, because you have to understand the passion of the listener, or viewer, or reader, because I'm going to—we're all we're all involved in writing now for the digital world, whether it's blogs or um, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Um, so we're now all everything, but there has to be—it is not a regular job. And you have to be willing to put in the extra time, and that means having a passion, but that also means understanding or trying to understand the passion of your the participants of whom you are broadcasting or talking about. It is the most misunderstood and misused 
element now, I think, in sport. We, we treat sports, and I don't, want to, I don't want to make it a generational thing, but I do see, uh, for now, perspective uh, broadcasters, they don't understand that part of it. And it is a game of Madden to them, or uh, it's digital figures, as Vince Vaughn said. Um, the great ones and the ones who get it will understand the, the verse in Romans, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. If, you have, if you're passionate enough about what you cover and do to understand that, mainly having passion for others, then, and then you have to be willing to put in the time and, and just be intensely interested, which I think is what the definition of passion is. And the perspective kind of bleeds over into that. But in what environment are we broadcasting this game? And who's, who's watching, listening, or reading? And what do they want to know? And what... Uh, what... Uh, what, what does it mean to them? And so that goes in to the psychology of winning. We went through a downturn, obviously, this year. After the 5-0 and start, we were 1-6, and six, and there was an incredible amount of tension around that place, a bunch, because we thought we had the best team in the league. Now, all of a sudden, we're not even sure if we're going to make the playoffs. And it created a lot of tension in the workplace. So my approach to our players, to Andy, to the rest of our coaches had to be very sensitive to that. So uh, that's, a, that's another box we don't check a lot with, with prospective broadcasters, whether they're young or old or, or just want to get into business because it sounds cool or I want to write a blog. And uh, perseverance is absolutely necessary, particularly if you, if you climb. What people see are the end results. They don't see, I mean, the fact that I was a finalist for the Carolina, or for the uh, Minnesota Vikings and the Atlanta Falcons and the Chicago Bears, and there were 300 applicants, and I got to the finals in all three and didn't get any of them. And I filled in for Kevin Harlan when he was auditioning basically for NBC, so I did one game, and now he left, and the Chiefs job was open, and my audition tape was that team. I mean, how many times has that happened? I thought, wow, if I don't get this, you know, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. But uh, go to Neptune on some spacecraft. But uh, this is a profession where you lose more than you win, and because the losses come in different ways. And it also now this bleeds over into perspective too. Um, but not every coach you're going to deal with is a good person. And you have to persevere. Because now even inside your fort or the team that you're covering, you're dealing with personalities that you don't necessarily like or respect, but you don't have that choice to decide they stay or go. And you have to have perseverance and, and toughness to to, uh, to do that. Uh, for example, off the record, now this isn't in the book, but like this tournament I'm going to do, I really thought I'd be doing the Big 12. It's Kansas City, it's here. And they're shipping me to the Sun Belt to work with a guy that I'd requested a year ago that I don't want to work with. And so, it's, I'm, this isn't going to be, this doesn't feel like a whole lot of fun. So, if I'm going to walk my walk, walk my talk, it's, I need to have perspective because these teams that I'm going to, and I don't know a soul because it's not the leagues I cover. I don't know the coaches. I've gone through the coaching staffs and go, I don't even know these guys. And I know coaches all across the country in every league, seemingly. I don't know these players. But it's the biggest thing to them, in many cases, in their lives, because they're playing for an automatic bid. So even though it doesn't seem like a whole lot of fun to me, i got to get my mind right. And after I leave you, I'm going to just be grinding on preparation for teams that I don't know anything about. And, uh, and then perseverance is involved here, because I'm sitting here going, 
I can't believe this. But this happens all the time. And for example, if you work for ESPN, even as an independent contractor, it's I mean it's 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 getting tougher and tougher, but you've you gotta persevere. And so it takes a mental, emotional, physical, spiritual toughness to uh, to make it in this business. It's not what people think. Yeah. And and so if you sign on and check the box and you gotta be ready to go. Um, but to be unusually passionate, perspective, perseverance, and then the preparation. Um, so a top one, entertainer, journalist, visionary, artist, all of the above. It's black in the oval, all of the above. Those are not mutually exclusive. And depending on the assignment, depending on the game, Different things, different, each, each one of those categories could be emphasized at any different time, but they're all all important. No one greater than the other, and no one less important than the other, and, and uh, it's all of that. It's one of the things I try to do with everything that I do, or, or hit every one of those. Okay. The last question is just final thoughts. Anything that, that you haven't mentioned that you think readers would be interested in? Anything you think? Um, just why why is the and the other thing that I and I'm going to put this in there when I talk to undergraduates or high school students learn to compete and learn to perform they may hate doing competitive forensics but I'd almost require it. Is that extent? Is that duet? Is that informative? Is that debate? Choose something. Are you on the cross country team? Well, I'm not very fast. Well, can you run? Yeah, I can run. Will you be challenged? And it'll, well, then try that. Or what is it that you do like? You want to learn to compete. Learn what it feels like to lose in the final seconds. Um, and learn what it means to win in the final seconds. But then you have to learn to perform too. You must, there's got to be a performance. And there's got to be a level of performance. For example, um, some of it is God given, a lot of it's God given. But it's voice, it's diction, it's deliverance. It's, it's, you have to be a performer. And there's just all of these boxes that have to be ch checked. That might be a fifth P, actually. Um, it would be performer. But you have to have a certain level of, I mean, I want to sing with the Kansas City Symphony and be one of their vocalists, but that's not going to happen. So there's a, there's a, this isn't for everybody. And so I'm, I'm often curious of why many want to do it, very few do do it. The ones that do it well, why? So it's a constant study, but... Uh, but it's... it's uh, there's just a whole lot more there than meets the eye. But the impact can be profound. And it goes beyond sports. That's that'd be what I tell people. But the best ones are kind of wired that way. And they understand. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. And just be ready for setbacks because there's man management changes and ownership changes, and uh, you get your rear end kicked. That's the perseverance part. You get your rear end kicked, and you didn't deserve it. Happens all the time in this business. And it's it's you, you get up and. Keep riding. That, that knocks a lot of people out because they're like, it's it's always constant. And I touch a lot of worlds based, based on what I do. And there's not all green lights ever at any of this. And I'm dealing with situations now um, that are unpleasant, but it comes with the territory. If you sign on, it's, yeah, so... 
Anyway. All right. We good? Anyway. All right. We good? Anyway. All right. We good?